transparent about the carbon footprint of every single product that we sell. Why? Well, it's very simple, Neil. At the end of the day, it's not just companies who need to be net zero by 2050. It's also you and me as uh, consumers. And, um, you know, the funny thing is, is that uh, I have no idea what my personal carbon footprint is. And I would bet that you don't know either. Yeah, he's right. I have no idea. Do you? Not really. No. It's not easy for you to make choices in your life or in my life as a consumer uh, to live a more uh, carbon neutral life. And so we believe that just in the same way that 30 years ago, there was no uh, a calorie count on products. And today it's a very standardized way. You can count calories if you want to do, and it's an obligation to have calories on your product. We actually believe that putting the carbon footprint on products will actually help inform consumers and help them make the right choices for them to become net zero by 2050. Sounds great, right? But carbon labelling is not quite as easy as it sounds. Others have tried this before. My name is David North and I am the Chief Strategy Officer at a South African retailer called Pick and Pay. He used to work at Tesco, one of the first international supermarkets to roll out carbon labelling over a decade ago. So we started that around 2007 and, and did 100 or so products in the first year and then accelerated that over time. And in the end, we did over a 1,000 products. I find it kind of interesting that rather than just looking at what you were doing, you were also looking at what customers are doing. Why did you want to include customers? When we looked at our own carbon footprint as a business, as a very large, very, very large international business, it came to around 5 million tonnes of, of CO2 equivalent. And then when we looked at what customers did, what all of us do in our own lives, that was 100 times our direct footprint. And therefore, you know, we reached the conclusion that the only way we were going to have an impact in terms of tackling climate change as a business was to communicate to and engage our customers. If we could get millions on this revolution in green consumption, then, uh, then we'd have a big impact. So that was the thinking behind it. Tesco's label had a little black footprint with numbers of grams of carbon emitted. And to help customers understand what those numbers meant, they put comparisons alongside. For example? So if you bought long life orange juice from a shelf versus the fresh stuff from the fridge, it would tell you that you were saving, you know, a few grams of carbon as you'd cut out the emissions from refrigeration. Wow, that's really granular. Yeah, and they started to try it on more and more products with added incentives. We put carbon labels onto energy saving light bulbs and we also reduced the price of those light bulbs so that they were as cheap as the old incandescent light bulbs. And that combination of initiatives meant that we sold more energy saving light bulbs in a week than we'd sold previously in the whole year. That suggests to me that price is probably a really important factor here when you're trying to encourage people to make good decisions, to nudge them into the behaviour that you would like. Price is a huge factor, but if you can combine the two so that people can buy something that is a lower price and is the greener equivalent, then I think you're on to a win-win. He thought so, but ultimately his bosses weren't convinced. The cost of figuring out exactly what each label should say and the fact that few brands and no other supermarkets followed suit led a new CEO to kill Tesco's carbon labeling drive five years after it started. It was a huge shame because we were building momentum at the time. Yeah, I can imagine, you know, you've worked so hard to make something that you felt was really worthwhile and that you were proud of and, you know, galvanized by what you'd seen and, and read. And then it was just gone like that. It was. Um, and I think, I mean, as I look at it now, it's fantastic that another generation of business leaders have taken up that challenge. David says Tesco approached Unilever to be part of the labeling project, but they said no. Today, Mark Engel says times have changed. I can absolutely understand why 10 years ago, 
You know, there was much less excitement about all of this. Where we are now in 2021, I do believe that we have a much better chance of success because everybody is behind it right now. And so I think the willingness to cooperate and to make it happen is perhaps far greater than it was 10 years ago. Have you done research that shows customers actually want this? Yes. What we are seeing is Generation Z and Millennials are much, much more willing to make choices, informed choices about responsible products and brands. So that's also why we're doing it. At the end of the day, we're doing it because we believe that this is what consumers will ask from business. You know, this is not uh, something that we made up ourselves. We're very clearly seeing that consumers will want to know that consumers care and that consumers will choose or not choose your brand depending on whether you He stressed informed choices there. And this is where the question of carbon labeling gets really tricky. Yeah, because working out the carbon footprint of, say, a tomato, turns out it's really hard. And wrestling with academics and researchers are in the same boat too. Where do you begin? Do you begin at resource extraction and production, i.e. farming, for example? And where do you end? Is it the retail shelf or is it the consumer? She's got the questions and she's got some of the answers too. She's Dr. Zaina Gadima, an expert in supply chain management and ethics at Northumbria University in the UK. I hear something rustling. Are you perhaps moving a pen or... Oh, a... I do apologise. I'll close the door. It's my guinea pig. That's your oh. guinea pig. That's a first. <laughs> yeah, no, if you could shut the door, that would be great. Give me two seconds. Do you have a guinea pig story? I do, actually. I had one as a kid, and it had three names. <laughs> That's pretty grand for a guinea pig. <laughs> yeah, it is, isn't it? A long story, though. Welcome back, everybody. Hi. Hello. Welcome back. So I think um, the problem with footprinting is it's almost impossible to include the consumption stage associated with the consumer because we all deal with the products that we purchase and dispose of differently. So you, it's very difficult to include that. Unilever does it by measuring the carbon footprint from production to the store shelf. And it tries to figure out the impact of how the consumer disposes of it. Tesco's did it differently. It included an estimate of the carbon emitted in the kitchen as well as disposal of packaging. And then there's the co-op's way in Denmark. Julie got the co-op's Thomas Rowland to explain. We probably sell around 100 to 150,000 different products in our stores. And if you're going to calculate all these products uh, to a level of detail where you can actually... ...task. So that's why we work on a category level instead of working with the specific item. Right. So instead of working out the carbon footprint of each brand of rice, they've just worked out an average for all rice. And they think they've got a good reason to do that. We think climate labeling is questionable in how efficient it will be to actually lower the footprint. If you give the impression to consumers that you could just choose, say, the climate-friendly edition of pork or the climate-friendly edition of beer, then you will be heavily disappointed because it's not actually uh, to change your consumption patterns within a category that will lower the climate footprint. It is actually changing your consumption patterns, maybe to lower your uh, use of products in certain categories. All these different ways to count carbon makes it hard on consumers to compare like for like. That's certainly what Zaina Gadima thinks. That's our supply chain expert with a guinea pig. Is there any evidence, I mean, given how patchy the efforts have been so far to apply carbon labels to products, is there any evidence that shows it actually changes the way in which we shop? I'm not sure that the carbon footprinting label as it stands will generate a sea change in customer behavior in terms of purchasing products with carbon labels because you can't compare like for like within the same product categories. So it makes it difficult. It raises a risk that companies can use carbon labels to grab our attention rather than to actually reduce emissions. 
Mm, greenwashing. Yeah, misleading us about how environmentally sound they are. So there is a potential for greenwashing, but I do believe that with almost any environmental or ethical labelling scheme, that there is the potential for that. And that's a huge problem, and I guess, in, in trying to get trust from consumers and faith in the actual labels. So I think the comparisons such as Fair Trade and the Rainforest Alliance as other labelling schemes, they're very well known, they're generally accepted, and I think carbon footprint labels has a way to catch up. But they'll get there. Oh, you're very, you're positive. I, I, I have to be. <laughs> Looking back now, this was 10 years ago, you've moved on to South Africa. Is there anything you would have done differently? Sorry, I'm just thinking about that for a minute. It's quite a good question. Um, well, he thinks, I'll remind you, this is David North, who used to work at Tesco. I think probably, as I look back, what we might have done differently was to have spent even more time trying to get other businesses, trying to get governments, and indeed trying to get uh, consumer organisations to understand what we were doing. What challenged us was simply that we felt for so long that we were doing it essentially on our own. So I think spending more time winning the hearts and minds of our competitors and the brands that supplied us would be what I'd do differently. What do you think is holding retailers and brands back from adopting something like a carbon label? Well, I think some are daunted by the size of it. And I think my advice to them would be get started. Just do a few. You'll learn things and you'll learn things about your products. And in one, two, three, five years down the line, you'll be a lot further than if you just sit and, uh, and sort of worry about how you might do it and uh, try to achieve perfection before you start doing anything. Do you ever wake up in the night and just think, we'll never do this. This is way too complicated. We're never going to be able to communicate this in a kind of reasonable way to consumers. When you're pushing the boundary, sometimes you think, yeah, this is a huge task. But it's always one step at a time. This is creating a movement. If you look back at the the label on nutrition, uh, it took us 30 years to get that harmonized and right. So if you look at that journey, you know, Next time we'll keep food on the menu by looking at food waste. Growing, shipping, packaging, storing, then throwing away food is not just bonkers. It has huge implications for climate change. We're asking, why can't we stop wasting food? But before then, what have you seen in climate news this week, Neil? Well, the big one, of course, is Joe Biden's climate summit, which we trailed in last week's show. It's happening as we record this, and there is a lot to cover. There are 40 countries involved. We anticipated a big American announcement, and we got it. A promise to cut emissions by at least half by 2030 relative to 2005. That's a much more ambitious target than the U.S. was working to before. Mm. In the U.K., we've seen some announcements here. Actually, a pretty radical target for 2035, a 78% reduction in carbon emissions. I think this is the most ambitious target I've seen. Have you seen anything like it? No, I think it is kind of top of the class. The morning before the summit, um, the EU came up with a new target, at least 55% decrease in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. This is compared with 1990 levels. Before, it was at 40%, so it's a step in the right direction. Uh, though China has not announced a new target, India has not announced a new target. And the kind of takeaway, if you're looking for one from this, Christiana Figueres, who helped broker the Paris Climate Agreement in 2015, has tweeted, finally, the wind is at our back on the climate crisis. Greta Thunberg is less impressed. She's released a statement which says the gap between what we're doing and what needs to be done is widening by the minute. We need to call out the bull Oh, sorry, Greya, I can't finish that word because we're out of time. <laughs> Nicely done, Neil. Nicely done. 